So, hello everybody. This is uh, Pascal from Neutrality Studies. I've got with me today uh, David X. Nowak, an, uh, a good friend of mine. And um, excuse me, uh, he's a David is uh, a PhD candidate at the University of Mannheim. <clears throat> um, he's almost done with his PhD, as far as I understand. Um, I, I'll ask you in a second. He's also currently lecturing at the uh, University of, uh, where do I have it? At the, the sorry, which, which one are you lecturing at? Bremen. Bremen. <laughs> at Bremen, University of Bremen, right. And the point was that you wrote this dissertation of yours about Central Asia in the 1910s, uh, 20s, 30s, uh, about, uh, uh, well, about Central Asia in German. And I ask you, David, would you be willing to give a talk about this also in English? And David very gracefully said, yeah, yes. And uh, that's where we are today. So uh, thank you very much, David, for saying yes. And let us maybe know uh, before we start. So where are you? Is you when, when are you going to be a doctor? Yes, uh, thanks for the invitation. And um, yeah, I'll, I like the neutrality studies and this YouTube um, format. And um, I'm glad to be here. And I wrote my PhD dissertation and I defended it, but I cannot call myself a doctor until I have published it. And I will publish it hopefully early 2024, or no, I have to publish it until then. And then I can call myself a, a doctor, but I'm still a master, even though I've already defended the, the PhD dissertation. And it will be in German. And afterwards, I'm gonna search for funds in order to get it translated, in order to get it translated into English because I think the most um, or many Central Asian researchers are uh, spread around the world and speak English. And I think they, they need to read it in English. But if they want to get a, a sense of what I have done, then they can listen to this uh, presentation now. Yes, exactly. That's why, why we are here. Um, the two of us, we already collaborated twice in two book projects, uh, one in 2018 and one just very recently that came out, uh, this one here. For anyone uh, neutral beyond the cold, in which we um, looked at neutral countries after the Cold War, but you're going to take us back now uh, to the about a hundred years into the second tournament of shadows, and I'll uh, just bring up your presentation here, and I'll let you take it away, David. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, first um, I'm going to have some preliminary preliminary remarks because not uh, many people know what the Tournament of Shadows is or was. Um, the term Tournament of Shadows is uh, the Russian equivalent to what we call in the West the Great Game. So in the 19th century, I'm going to talk about it um, soon. Um, the, the British and the Russians uh, vied for influence in Central Asia and what we call the Great Game or in German, das große Spiel. Um, that's what the Russians call the Tournament of Shadows. And um, I think it's more appropriate to call it Tournament of Shadows in the 1920s and 1930s, um, because after the Great War, um, Great Games seems a bit, seems a bit off um, in, in my time. And yeah, the, the, the term Tournament of Shadows was um, coined by Karl Robert von Nesselrode. He was the Russian foreign minister for the, um, from 1816 to 1856. So first to the structure, I'm going to talk shortly about the first Tournament of Shadows and what we have to learn from that conflict in order to get to the second Tournament of Shadows. Then I will give a brief overview about the second Tournament of Shadows, um, say something about the sources which I have analyzed for my PhD dissertation. And then I'm going to go into the three phases that I have identified within the second Tournament of Shadows. And um, yeah, then I'll come to my conclusion and uh, the question, was it a second great game or a second tournament of shadows or was it the first Cold War? So um, in the first tournament of shadows in the 19th century, um, Britain or the British um, from India, from the south and the Russians from the north tried to expand their colonial empires and zones of influences. And yeah, they all, both sides had their own, um, their own term for, for this bigger conflict. Um, great game or tournament of shadows and initially both sides failed with their first expeditions the Britain 
the British in Afghanistan, 1838 to 1842, and the Russians in Khiva in, in the north, I'm going to show a map soon, in 1839, 1840. And then they expanded to other regions, and the breakthrough for the Russians was in the 1860s and 1870s. Then they conquered Bukhara, which was a local emirate, so a local um, state there, and Khiva and Kokand. Uh, in the 1860s, 1870s, and they brought the, the Tsarist Empire close to British India. The British victory over Afghanistan in the Second Anglo-Afghan War then led to, to the British and the Russian zones bordering each other. So the Afghan northern border was also the border between the British zone of influence in the south and the Russians in the north. And at this border, there was the Panjai incident or the Battle of Kushka in 1885, where Russian soldiers fought against Afghan soldiers with British officers, and it looked like it could turn into um, yeah, an Anglo-Russian war. Uh, and Chancellor Bismarck in Germany, he tried to encourage both sides um, to engage more in the Central Asian theater of war because he wanted both powers to draw away their troops from Europe, um, but it didn't turn into a war in the end. And in, for the whole 19th century, for this whole conflict, we have to keep in mind that both sides mostly misunderstood the actions of the other great power and overestimated each other side's power. So it was mostly a conflict. Uh, it was a matter of perception, and they always or they often had um, the perception that the other power was more influential, more, um, more st or stronger than they, yeah, than they really or than they really were. And in the end, the rising German influence in the 1890s and early 1900s um, led to the Anglo-Russian Convention of 1907, where um, in St. Petersburg, uh, emissaries from the British and the Russians delineated borders and zones of influence and ended this conflict because um, yeah, the, the Russians continued to dominate the North and also Northern Persia and the British, the South, including Tibet, Afghanistan, and some parts of um, Southern Persia. And then this conflict was over, but then in the First World War, the Germans tried to come in and um, yeah, ally themselves with local movements in order to um, stir, um, stir up the local peoples against the British and the Russians, um, but they mostly failed, or they, they failed with, with those ambitions. Um, so now we come to the time after the First World War. The Second Tournament of Shadows was a phase of Central Asian economic, political, and military history in the interwar period. It involved the local states, but also Germany, Great Britain, and Soviet Russia, or um, so the Soviet Union beginning in 1922. And the conflict had similarities with the Great Game of the 19th century, so the First Tournament of Shadows but also with the Cold War of the 1950s and 1960s. I'm going to go into detail to that um, later. And after reviewing the collective files, I was in London and Moscow, also in Washington and in Berlin in order to collect files. Um, I subdivided the Second Tournament of Shadows into three phases. The first phase immediately after the First World War, um, where several borders were redrawn and some states became independent or um, yeah, became independent again in case of Afghanistan. Then the second phase, the Golden Twenties, where there were rare, conf rare military conflicts. It was more um, um, yeah, a political and economic um, competition of the great powers for influence in the region. And then the third phase, again, with many military conflicts in the shadow of the um, world economic crisis that started in 1929, which also changed the evaluation of some of the powers and um, what could they achieve in the region and what they couldn't achieve in the region. So first, about the sources. I'm a historian. Um, I, I studied military history, but this was more diplomatic history. And I focused on the diplomatic files on, from the British, the German, and the Soviets, also some French for some details, but the French didn't play a major role in the region. Um, and I studied the diplomatic files about what I call Greater Turkestan from 1919 until 1933, in some areas 1934. And Greater Turkestan includes, in my understanding, Persian Turkestan, that's the province in the northeast, Khorasan, Khorasan around Meshed, which is the second largest Persian city today, also was a major city back then. 
uh, then Afghan Turkestan, so northern Afghanistan with Mazai Sharif, Herat, Maimana, Kunduz, um, and Soviet Turkestan, which includes all the territories of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan today. But because I lo looked upon the perception of the other great powers, and I can tell you already the the Germans and the British did not know much about what was happening in Kazakhstan. They only had um, messages from the border areas, and the further away you came from the borders, they list, uh, they, the less they, they knew. Um, and Tajikistan, just one detail, it's not a Turkish, a, a Turk country, a Turkic country, it's a Persian country, but until 1929, Tajikistan was part of Uzbekistan within the Soviet Union, and it's surrounded by Turkic people, so I include it here as well, because it would be a black hole in the middle if I wouldn't have looked at uh, Tajikistan. And also Chinese Turkestan, Xinjiang, in the files often called Xinjiang, where the Uyghurs live, uh, a Chinese province um, in, yeah, in the east of what I consider Greater Turkestan. That's the area I analyzed, or in which I analyzed the perception of a great power of each other. Um, I also have some government files. The German government once dealt with Central Asia, the British government, on several occasions dealt with Central Asia and the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party Bolsheviki, which later became the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, they dealt quite often with Central Asia. And I've got, uh, I've looked through all this CC files from 1990 to 1933, and it was a topic over the whole years, Afghanistan, but also um, Xinjiang, sometimes Persia, um, so the not the head of state, but the head of the party, which dominated the state or controlled the state, and they dealt quite often with Central Asia. Um, yeah, I've only oh, I've exclusively top-down perspectives by non-Turkic people, by people not not from the region, mostly Germans, British, um, Russians, or Ukrainians in some occasions, um, who talked about the region. Sometimes I've got. Local politicians like um, Fajullah Khojaev, he was the foreign minister of um, Bukhara. I'm going to show that later, and later became yeah, the, the head of Uzbekistan uh, within the Soviet Union. But that's, um, I've got mostly top down perspective from external actors. Um, I've collected 40,000 British files of pages um, of files that were yeah, quite a lot. I, I hadn't estimated there when I went there for the first two months in order to, to collect files. So I had to come back later. Um, then I've got about 4,000 pages of German files. And I can say pretty much that I've got all the files, the diplomatic, the official files um, from the Germans about this region. There are no or only some military files. They were mostly destroyed in the Second World War. And so from the Germans, I can say I've got nearly all files that are in the archives in Germany. And from the Soviet side, or from the Russian side, I visited the archives in, in Moscow. I only have a, yeah, a, a small detail or some aspects of the files, but there are plenty more, thousands of pages more. But even five years ago when I was there, the, um, the archive restrictions were very strict and I couldn't collect many files. So I, I mostly concentrate on, on the British files and what they perceived and then from the points where I've got Soviet files, I could um, turn it into a contact with the Germans and the, the British and look at how they perceived each other. But the Soviets, um, someday people might collect even thousands of pages of the Soviet files and then write a second history of my, of my era from 1990 to 1933. But I tried and that's all I've got or all I got when I was there five years ago. So to the first phase. In the first phase, in, from 1919 to 1923, um, Afghanistan became independent. The Third Anglo-Afghan War, Amanullah came into power in 1919, in um, early 1919. Then um, there was the Amritsar massacre in, in British India, and the Afghan king thought there might be a second uprising in India, like in the mid-19th century and that the Afghans could take the opportunity, conquer the territories of what is today Pakistan, so get an access to the sea and became independent again. They militarily failed, so the British could push them back and even bomb Kabul. And after several weeks or several months, um, the conflict was over, but still the British um, accepted the independence of Afghanistan. So 
uh, Afghanistan regained independence after losing it in the 1870s. Bukhara and Khiva, I'm sorry, but I wrote my PhD dissertation in German, that's why the maps are German, but uh, Bukhara and Khiva, they were two states, they were like princely states of the Russian Empire, so protectorates of Russia until 1917. Um, and they are kind of a wedge between the Aral Sea, which back then still existed, and the uh, northern Afghan border. And yeah, they were two states here. Um, they became independent after the October Revolution because they were they were already states, protectorates, and, and they established relations with Afghanistan then in 1917, 1918. Um, and they were independent um, for the first time since the Russian conquest. Um, yeah, and they acted independently. The, the Soviets first didn't know well to, if they accepted, but then uh, they had no other choice but to accept it in 1917, 1918. Uh, but then in 1920, in the wake of the Russian Civil War, the Red Army conquered those territories too. But they didn't annex it. They installed new governments by the so-called Young Bukharans and Young Khivans. They um, were called like this because of the Young Turks. So they were modernist forces in their countries or sometimes in exile. And they came to power and they allied themselves with the, with the Bolsheviki in order to established new states and they also sought close relations with the Kemalists in Turkey because they wanted to modernize the countries just like Turkey also did uh, under Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. So they were independent until 1920 and then in 1920 they were Soviet installed states but they also tried to uh, yeah, be autonomous and um, strengthen their independence by uh, searching close relations with Turkey, with Afghanistan. Um, not, not with Persia, not really, um, but they tried to distance themselves a bit um, from, from Soviet influence um, back then. And uh, yeah, Xinjiang, so Chinese Turkestan already was um, de facto independent back then. Um, in 1911, the Chinese Revolution um, established the Chinese Republic and the ad Chinese administration of Xinjiang. Um, they yeah, they were de facto independent. They didn't declare independence, but they acted independently and continued to do so until, yeah, mostly until 1943, uh, more or less. Um, and Persia resisted a British takeover. Persia wasn't a British colony back then. Um, but Lord Curzon, after the Russian influence vanished, after the October Revolution, or also the, the February Revolution, um, the hardliners and the British government tried to implement a treaty, an Anglo-Iranian treaty that would have turned Persia into a British protectorate, but the Persians resisted that. And they used also the Soviet, and even a bit the German influence in order to push away the British and uh, yeah, uh, remain independent or even become more independent than they were before. In 1921, there was an interesting rebellion in Meshet in Persian and Turkestan here in the northeast of Mohamed Taki Pesian. Pe Pesian. He was a Persian cavalry officer who fought in the First World War on the German side, on the Western Front, in the German Air Force even. Um, but his rebellion failed um, and uh, the central government uh, regained control of the area. But if he would have succeeded, then um, there would be a former German Air Force officer um, being the head of a government in Persian Turkestan, but as I said, it failed. Then in 1921, 1922, 1923, the first foreign diplomats arrived in Kabul and the more um, the, yeah, the conflicts waned and um, it turned to a more civil um, competition between the, the um, different um, foreign powers, the Germans, had a, an, a diplomatic mission in Kabul with the French, it's also the Italians and, and the British starting in 1921 too. The Russian Civil War ended uh, mostly in 1922 in Central Asia. Uh, also the Basmachi Rebellion, those were local rebels, not organized in any way, but they resisted um, the Bolshevik takeover of the region. And then at the end of 1922, um, the Soviet Union was created, which didn't change a lot initially in Central Asia. Bukhara and Shiva um, still remained independent and uh, Soviet Turkestan was still a part of the uh, Russian Social Socialist Federalist Republic, Federal Republic within the Soviet Union that 
changed only in the mid 1920s with a d uh, with a new uh, with the redrawing of the borders there and also in the first phase Reza Shah Pahlavi became Persia's prime minister so um, in Turkey we had Ataturk in Persia then we had Reza Shah Pahlavi and in Afghanistan um, King Amanullah who were all modernist forces who tried to establish a strong central government and introduce yeah, modernization reforms in their countries and that also influenced the way and they sought relations with the great powers with the different great powers um, yeah first there were several military conflicts in chinese also in, in soviet and in chinese turkestan the russian civil war was also fought in chinese turkestan that's a small detail that most people forgot but the the red forces pushed the white forces across the border and even fought them in Chinese Turkestan. But then the um, isolationist government under Yang Zemin, um, he's, he can be seen here on the left top, um, he disarmed the white um, armies and let them escape to China proper or to Shanghai, to, to the coastal regions. Um, and the Soviet forces then withdrew mostly. There were many forces in, in Ely, there was a consular guard, so there were many troops in part of northern Xinjiang, um, but the civil war ended there. And then one fascinating figure in, in this area, in this phase of the Tournament of Shadows was Enver Pasha, the former Ottoman minister of war and perpetrator of the Armenian genocide. Um, he was sent from Lenin to Central Asia because uh, Lenin knew um, that um, the, yeah, the local uh, Muslim rebels should be one over to to the soviet cause and he wanted to send them in Pasha as um the son-in-law of the last uh, ottoman sultan um but in central asia um Enver pasha yeah changed sides and w uh, went over to the rebels and tried to um yeah become the chief or one of the the heads of the rebel movement um but um his the rebellion was crushed in 1922 mostly and Enver Pasha was killed in what is today Tajikistan um, by Red Army troops. And the legend says it was an Armenian officer or uh, Armenian soldier who killed him, but um, that cannot be um, proven. Um, yeah, as I said, we had relatively strong central governments in Afghanistan and Persia who also invited diplomatic missions. And then the, the second phase began with embassies or with diplomatic missions of the several countries in Kabul, in Tehran, and also some consulates, uh, like Soviet consulates in northern Afghanistan. I'll come to that later. And in Xinjiang, um, Governor Yang Tsingxin um, tried to govern isolationists, but he had to deal with the Reds and the West in, in the course of the Russian Civil War. And he also had several consulates in his territory. So the British had a consulate in Kashgar, close to the British-Indian border. And there were two Soviet consulates in Kashgar and Romchi, and maybe even more, but uh, I haven't found sources that prove where all the uh, Soviet consulates were in the region. Um, in order to summarize the first phase, the Germans returned quite fast or quite quickly to, to the Middle East, mostly in cultural terms. They invited students from those territories, even from Bukhara. There was a Bukharan a mission in Germany and they brought students and um, uh, yeah, people who wanted to, um, not only university students, but also pupils from, from schools in order to, to Germany in order to train them. Economically, the Germans tried to establish um, the trade with those territories because they had lost their colonies and then searched for new markets where they could export their machinery. And mostly through the Soviet Union, they exported to Persia, to Afghanistan, and then even to Chinese Turkestan. And yeah, politically, they weren't in the League of Nations. They still had the, the, um, the heritage of the First World War that they confronted the Entente, so especially the British in Central Asia. So they were quite uh, well known and um, positively seen by many Central Asian um, state leaders. There were some military officers and the Versailles Treaty prohibited that German, Germany would send weapons or military officers to other countries, but there were some private adventurers who went to Afghanistan and then became an officer there. And also some pilots in the Afghan Air Force were from Germany. Um, and in the, when it comes to perceptions, 
the Germans often under, underestimated the British and the Soviet influence in the region. And they thought, well, it's not neither Soviet nor British, and we could um, gain strength in the region by influencing it yeah, politically, economically, culturally. The British, on the other side, constantly feared a Soviet invasion of British India that started already in 1920, so when the civil war was still raging in, in Russian Central Asia. And they didn't know what route the Red Army could take, either through Persia, so um, through Meshed and then Balochistan, and then to what is today Pakistan, or through Afghanistan, the central route, or through um, Xinjiang, the, the eastern route. But that would be would have been very difficult because of the high mountains uh, in, in northern British India. The British sympathized with the Basmachi, so with the Muslim rebels, but did not provide them with the support. The Soviets um, wrote that in their pro propaganda often, and you can still find it in, in many literature or in, in literature until today. But I can tell from the civilian files from the British that I've seen that they didn't know of any support for the rebels, and um, they had contact with them. They um, had emissaries who um, sent messages between them, and they tried to map where the rebels would be strong. But then the Red Army came and crushed the rebellion. And interestingly, especially for the first phase, the British feared the Germans. They still saw them as the arch enemy of the First World War, who conspired with the local Muslims and then the Soviets as well in order to uh, diminish British influence in the regions. And they, uh, the British also underestimated local emancipation movements like the, the Kemalists in Turkey and the Persian and the Afghan movements, who or the Bukharan and Khivan. The, the young Bukharans, the young Khivans, so the modernist movements who wanted to modernize their country and then relied on Soviet support, but they were not Soviet puppets. But the British always considered it, well, are they pro-British or are they pro-Soviet? And they didn't uh, differentiate much there. The Soviets on the other side focused on securing the border. First, the, the civil war had to end, and then the border should be secured, and also on economic questions. Already from the beginning, they were interested in questions like um, the export of wool from, from sheep, from Karakul sheep, and, and, and other economic questions, trans-border questions in order to integrate the region. And that was always a focus from, from the Soviet already from the beginning. And in 1922, um, Stalin, then the Commissar for Nationalities, um, yeah, had a concept of the Stalin plan so of a plan to shield Bukhara and Khiva from foreign influence, mostly from um, Turkish and Afghan influence, but that also meant cutting the ties of those territories to Germany, like the, the student mission that was in, in Berlin. And yeah, that was implemented in the following years. And then the territories yeah, were cut off the outside world and then became even part of the Soviet Union in 1924. And also interestingly, the Soviets cooperated with the central governments in Kabul, Tehran, and Urumqi, so in, in Chinese Turkestan, even though they were anti communists there were no communists party, but um, every workers' rebellion or local insurrections by peasants uh, was crushed by, by those governments. And there was even, there was no potential for a workers' rebellion or a Red Army of Afghanistan or something like that, not at that time. Um, but the Soviets cooperated with those governments closely because they thought if the governments could be strengthened, even though they crushed whatever left um, current is there, then they could also shield themselves from British influence. So the, the, the more the governments are strengthened, then the more they could distance themselves from Britain. And they even yeah, had to cast, cut their losses on their side, if you would say it like this, um, in order to win um, or in order to those governments to, yeah, to back off um, the British in, in their regions. Then I come to the second phase, the, the golden 20s, the, the mid-1920s. I call it a peaceful competition in my PhD dissertation. It's mostly um, a peaceful phase of competition of economic and political influence in Afghanistan, Persia, and Xinjiang, because Bukhara and Khiva were already shielded off and then um, became Uzbekistan within the Soviet Union. And the Germans continued to expand economically. They established airplane routes, first to Turkey, then to Persia, and then later also to, to Kabul, and then from Afghanistan, they wanted to fly to China. The German government adopted their first Central Asian strategy in 1926. They didn't call it Central Asian strategy, they called it the strategy for the 
awakening Asian states. Uh, and they considered Persia, Afghanistan, Xinjiang, and Mongolia to be those awakening Asian states. And they wrote down in the strategy, so the German government, the foreign minister and the economic minister, they wrote down that it would be in the interest of those states um, to modernize their countries with German machinery and to turn to Germany in order to get the, the, yeah, the funds and also the machinery in order to uh, modernize their countries. The Soviets continued or tried to expand with civil aid. They helped the Afghans to build an own air force. They built telegraph lines through Afghanistan, but they had major setbacks in, in China and in Afghanistan. First in Afghanistan, there was the border conflict over Ota Tugai, which is a border in the Amudaya in the, in the northern border river between Afghanistan and the Soviet Union. And the, the, it, for a long time, the Afghan and the Russian government um, weren't sure to which side the, the island would belong. And then the Red Army took it over and they thought that the Afghans would back off and they could take over this island. But then the, uh, the Turkish government um, um, yeah, issued a lot of pressure, diplomatic pressure to the Soviets. The Germans thought about um, selling planes to the Afghans in order so that they could move troops to northern Afghanistan. And the British, who controlled the ports in, in British India and uh, knew of uh, the weapons or could stop weapon shipments to Afghanistan, they supported the Afghans. So the, the situation turned worse for the Soviets um, for, for very, very quickly. And then they backed off and they um, gave back Afghanistan this, this small island, which is not really of significance uh, in the region. And yeah, the Soviet strategy for China failed spectacular in 1927 in China, oh, especially in South China, so very far away from Chinese Turkestan. Um, the Soviets relied on the Kuomintang, so the nationalists, and they supported them. They even established a military academy there and sent Soviet advisors there. And they pressured the communists to build a national front with the nationalists. And then the nationalists were strong enough and conquered the whole Chinese East Coast. So the um, yeah, more industrialized, the more um, economic, uh, economically important regions. And then after they, or while conquering, uh, those regions, the, the nationalists turned on the communists and they massacred the communists in Shanghai and um, stormed the Soviet consulate there and yeah, cut off all relations with the Soviets. And yeah, the, the Chinese Communist Party was awakened after that and the Soviet strategy in order to ri rely on that national front that included the nationalists and the communists yeah, failed spectacularly. And they cut off the diplomatic relations with uh, their new Chinese central government, but they still had the consulates in Manchuria and in Chinese Turkestan, and they just dealt with the local governments as if they were independent governments, but they didn't recognize them as independent. They just continued to, with their operations, like nothing has, has happened before. And then um, the, the Chinese communists had to yeah, uh, regroup and then go on the long march and then yeah, regain strength in the 1930s. So, um, a while later. And then in 1927, 1928, there was the war scare of those two years. Um, it was it were two years where the Soviets or the Soviet state leadership feared that all the capitalist country could turn into an, a large alliance ranging from France to Poland, Great Britain, and also to China in order to attack the Soviet Union. There were assassinations of Soviet diplomats in in Poland and in France and in Poland, Pisutsky, who was a fierce anti-Russian or anti-Soviet politician, uh, regained strength. And um, yeah, there was this war scare, but this had no repercussions in Central Asia because the British diplomats on the spot, uh, they described it and they said, well, we have witnessed um, war scares here before. This is nothing special. Um, and we don't have to make any preparations here for any conflict or something like that. And the British, and mostly I had British files, so that's the most important part. Um, they developed no strategy for Central Asia. So first they witnessed how the Russians vanished and they wrote reports, well, now British um, companies could conquer those markets here, um, but they didn't do anything. They had no strategies. They had no credits for their own companies in order to export to, to these regions. And then they witnessed how 
first the Germans, then the Americans, and later the Soviets or the Japanese as well, they conquered those markets and then dominated the imports and exports from regions like Chinese Turkestan and the British yeah, had no influence at all. And they developed no strategy and um, they turned to a form of self-occupation of an imperial apparatus. So they had many ministries, war office, India office, foreign office, also colonial office for other territories. They had many ministries, many secret services, many agencies um, who had to deal with the region and they had meetings, they drew maps of lines in the sands, the Soviets shouldn't cross, um, but they didn't communicate those red lines to the other side or to the public or to any um, party. And then the Soviets crossed it, like built airplane fields or airfields, aerodromes, um, close to the British Indian border. And then the British uh, again met in some meetings and drew new maps and um, yeah, wrote new red lines that the Soviets shouldn't dare to cross. And it was um, yeah, it was a form of self-occupation of this whole apparatus that had no strategy, that did not understand the region fully. And they they thought that the Afghan king was a Soviet ally until the border conflict of Ota Tugai, when he suddenly um, fired all his Soviet pilots in the Afghan Air Force. And the British realized, oh, he's uh, quite an independent uh, ruler, and um, but they had no strategy in order to dealing with that. And they were mostly concerned with themselves and held many indecisive meetings and wrote very, very long memoranda. So now we come to the third phase, which is more violent, again, like, like the first phase. First, there was a, a coup in Urumqi, so the, the Kuomintang conquered in the northern expedition. And the China proper, so the Chinese um, yeah, heartland or the Chinese uh, territories on the coast in the Pacific. And then um, Kuomintang members tried a coup in, in Urumqi in order to get this province, uh, yeah, um, to get this province under Kuomintang control. And they killed the governor, but then a loyalist from the old governor killed the coup, yeah, the putsch, the putschists, the Kuomintang members, and then he became the new governor, um, Jin Shuren, you can see in here on the left top. And he wasn't that isolationist like the old governor, but he also had an own strategy in order to deal with um, the, yeah, the competition with the Soviet influence from the north, the British from the south, because he turned to, to the Germans. And there was the um, Zeno-Swedish expedition in Germany. It's called Zeno-Swedish expedition because the Kuomintang um, and yeah, um, said that the half of the members should be Chinese and the other were European, Western European, most of them from Sweden, but also some Danish and many, many German former military officers and then pilots. And the German government funded this exposition through the Lufthansa, so the um, airplane carrier, the air carrier, so the big airline of Germany back then, um, because they wanted airfields for their civilian airlines um, through the region, but um, Jin Shuren was too isolationist in order to get that accepted. But he had Sven Hedin, a famous pro-German Swedish explorer of Central Asia um, in the region or often in the region and could deal with him and he could write to the German government. Um, and Jin Shuren also sent Burhan Shahidi as a representative to Berlin. Um, there were two consulates, one in Novosibirsk in Siberia and uh, another Chinese consulate in Central Asia. And he could uh, staff those consulates, but they were officially Chinese consulates. And he had one representative for one country that he um, sent himself, and that was to Germany. So he had this um, man, Bohan Shahidi, who later became the last Kuomintang governor of the province in 1949 and handed over the province to the Chinese uh, Red Army. Um, but back then he still studied and he hired Germans as teachers for a German school in Xinjiang. He bought German machinery and also tried to buy weapons, but he couldn't find them in Germany because of the Versailles Treaty or he couldn't buy them there. So he went to Switzerland and tried to buy the weapons there. And he and Jichuren sought, the, the, sought those close relations with Germany because he tried to escape the um, constant Russian British or then Soviet British vying for influence in his region. And he wanted to modernize his country with German um, help in order to get rid of the Soviet and the British influence. But um, due to the borders situation, he had to deal with the Soviets quite a lot and the Soviets took over the 
the trade with the region more and more. Quite different than the short coup in Urumqi was the civil war in Afghanistan that started in late 1928 and lasted until October 1929. Um, rebels, conservative rebels who turned against the um, reforms of Amanullah surrounded the, the capital, Kabul, and um, King Amanullah abdicated. He gave the crown to his brother and then took the car to Kandahar. His brother reigned for three days and then um, went by plane to British India because the British started the Kabul airlift, the first time that great powers, in this case Great Britain and later the Soviet Union as well, um, evacuated civilians or their nationals and also other nationals from a country torn apart by a civil war. Um, yeah, and when Amanullah arrived in Kandahar, his brother had also abdicated and he reclaimed the throne, but he couldn't garner support in the country and later fled and uh, fled the country and went into exile to Rome. And um, from January 1929 to October, the Tajik Habibullah Kalakani, who led the, the rebels, um, yeah, reigned as the new king. He was not a nobleman. He was called Bacha Yezakao, the son of a water carrier. Also in the files, the Germans and the British always write, or nearly always write, Bacha Yezakao, son of a water carrier. So from a, from a, yeah, from a simple background. So not from, not a nobleman, um, but a man of the people, if you would call it like this. His father had a very um, simple job, and he tried to um, yeah gain influence by turning very conservative, very um, against reforms, he allied himself with the Basmachi exiles who were still in northern Afghanistan after the Red Army had won the Civil War in 1922-1923. Um, and he armed um, the rebels um, and the Basmachi then occupied Garn. Here we have, have a map of Tajikistan, which is more or less like an, like an H. And here in the in the west, we have the more populated areas, and here in the east is the Pamir, so it's not very populated. And the Basmachi invaded from south, from the south, from Afghanistan, occupied Garm, and split Tajikistan into two, into two parts. And then the Red Army uh, reacted with the first world's first large-scale air landing operation, because they had the airplanes, they had improvised airfields, and then they sent troops there in order to crush um, the Basmach, the yeah, regained Basmachi insurrection um, in Tajikistan. And maybe they even invaded in northern Afghanistan. That's also a story where you can find in many books um, about Afghanistan in the 1920s. Uh, and the story is that a Soviet or a Red Army force uh, went into northern Afghanistan, occupied Mazai Sharif. Um, but later was um, yeah, pushed back by the Basmachi or by the, by the local uh, Kalakani allies, um, pushed back into the Soviet Union. But the, the thing is that I have not seen any file that proves that there were Red Army soldiers. There are some, um, red, uh, some Soviet files of the ambassador in Kabul who says there is no intervention. Then I've got the British files in Meshed. They describe, well, there are some forces crossing the borders, mostly Afghan students who uh, come back from studying abroad and then uh, go back to their homeland in order to uh, help their old um, King Amanullah. The Germans didn't know of anything. And there's even a, an English language Wikipedia article about this allegedly um, Red Army invasion of Northern Afghanistan, but I haven't seen any files, any primary file uh, that proves that. And in the end, the civil war ends uh, with Mohammed Nadi Khan, who was a influential nobleman back then in exile in Paris. And he returned from exiles. He could garner support um, in the Pashtun areas of British India. And then, yeah, an army of Pashtuns uh, conquered Afghanistan from the south. And he could, uh, yeah, conquer Kabul and then was crowned king himself. And then the civil war ended um, after nearly a year. Uh, here we have got a map of northern Afghanistan and the Soviet consulates were in Herat, Maimana, and Malzir Ashrif, and there was the embassy in Kabul. And as the story goes, the Soviets invaded here and uh, Mazai Sharif and the local Soviet consul then was the new head of the occupation um, government there. And he also went back uh, with the allegedly Red Army troops in, in the May 1929. 
Um, yes, and then we come, oh, we're still in the third phase. Um, Mohammed Nadia Shah, as he called himself then, the new king, turned to a gradual modernization, not that ambitious like King Amanullah. Um, he improved relations with the British, who thought that they had helped him to, um, get to um, gain the throne, but he um, himself considered him king of the Pashtuns, so also of, of the Pashtuns on the British Indian um, side of the border. So there were some frictions there. It wasn't that easy. He was more conservative and more leaning to, to the British, but uh, it wasn't an easy relation. The Soviets, um, until 1931, hunted Basmachi in northern Afghanistan, even without the approval of the central government in Kabul, and could um, yeah, hunt them down. And they also seized arms export and help for the Afghan Air Force. And they yeah, nearly stopped every uh, the bilateral relations or um, um, yeah, minimized the, the contacts between the Afghans and the Soviets because um, they knew that Nadia Shah wasn't uh, somebody who could be won over as an ally. And in the end, in 1933, Nadia Shah was assassinated in the German school in Kabul. There was still the German school. Um, the Germans didn't regain strength after the civil war because many Germans fled the, uh, um, in the course of the war and many um, projects were destroyed. Um, and yeah, in the end, he, um, Nadia Shah was even killed in the German school by a former student of the school. And afterwards, in 1934-1935, Afghan governments to Germany ceased to exist at all. Jin Shuren in Chinese Turkestan, he was um, he was Chinese himself from Chinese proper, so from the Chinese heartlands, and he had a very strong anti-Muslim policy, and that led to the Hami uprising. Um, I've got a map here. Hami is uh, in the east of Xinjiang. And this uprising and the rebel takeover of the region there led to Xinjiang being cut off of China because in Tibet and, and Xinhai here in the south, there are large mountains and no passes or back then no known passes um, over those mountains. Then there was British India, also uh, Himalaya mountains, so also very high. And, and the only yeah, caravan route went through Hami to to Gansu and to China proper or through Mongolia. So he um, was currently dependent on the Soviets and on the Mongolians, Soviet allies. So Mongolia was a People's Republic and back then, established in 1921. Um, so he had to deal with the Soviets and even bought weapons there and allowed the Soviet consulates to still exist there. Here's a map. Uh, it's again in German, I'm sorry. But um, I've pinpointed here the allegedly um, Soviet consulates, according to the British files, because the British were sitting in the south here, close to the British India border in Kashgar, and they didn't know where the Soviet consulate were. And you could um, find files with consulates allegedly here, in Turfan even, or in Altai, but the British didn't know. So the, uh, it was very far away for, the, for, for them. They only ha had news from the surrounding areas of, of Kashgar. But there was the Hami rebellion, um, in, starting in 1931, and that was mostly contained to the Hami area in 1931, 1932. And in 1933, Ma Songying um, invaded from Gansu. He was a warlord from the Ma family, the famous Ma family that, con uh, that dominated um, central China uh, in the 1920s, 1930s, even up to the 1940s. And he allied himself with the Kuomintang and the local Hami rebels and he wanted to become the new governor. So he marched to uh, Urumqi and um, yeah, tried to conquer the capital. But then there was uh, the Abdul Karim affair also. Abdul Karim was a former Ottoman prince. Here on the right, you can see him on a picture taken. And I think in Japan, I've, I've just found this picture yesterday. I haven't seen it before. So he was a former Ottoman prince. He um, made travels around British India and Malaysia and um, yeah, gained support of several Muslim noblemen in those territories and um, gained money because he wanted um, to create a Muslim empire in Central Asia, so in Xinjiang. And he also had some Japanese support. And we have this photo here from him um, with Japanese officers or Japanese soldiers. And in, sometimes in the literature, we can also find that he was brought from the Japanese into Xinjiang. So while there was the rebellion, he was um, brought there, um, and yeah, that's what the, the Soviets feared. After Manchukuo in 1931 was created, so a, um, a Japanese puppet state 
on Chinese ground. Um, the Soviets feared that there would be another puppet state with, a, in this case, an Ottoman um, puppet leader, but uh, dominated by the Japanese. And that's why in 1934, the, the Red Army invaded and they conquered the whole territory except for a small buffer zone um, south to uh, close to the British, uh, close to British India in the south. And then, yeah, the vying for influence of the British and of the German in the region ceased because the Soviets uh, dominated the whole territory for the forthcoming years. So I come to my conclusion. Uh, was it a second great game or the first Cold War? The second tournament of shadows ended similar to the first one. The Soviets dominated the north, Soviet Turkestan and Xinjiang. The British had larger influence in the south with Afghanistan and Persia, but also with German influence there. In Afghanistan, it stopped after the assassination of the Afghan king, but um, in the mid-1930s, the, the Germans could regain strength there. Um, and the difference to 1907, when the British and the Russian government um, had their Anglo-Russian convention and um, yeah, took their maps and um, uh, de defined which zones of influence each power had. And this time, the local developments in interplay with the great powers led to this outcome of this second great game. So the local actors have to be taken more serious. The British didn't take them much serious, but um, the local developments um, yeah, led to the, the ending that I took here in my PhD dissertation in 1933, 1934. The Germans played a, an important role in Turkestan through the whole time from 1919 to 1933. They often positioned themselves between Great Britain and the Soviet Union. In case of the airlift, they evacuated with the British and some with the Soviets to the north. They wouldn't rely only on one power. They tried to distance themselves from, from both powers um, from time to time. And they always searched for economic inter opportunities and had no political concepts. So there were no designs who should become king. They were only interested in trade. The Soviets tried to secure the borders because um, Chinese Turkestan was called their, their soft underbelly there. But they also had a strategy for cross-border economic integration, which was successful in Xinjiang, where they could dominate um, the, the imports and exports and take over the whole trade of the region, but which wasn't successful in Persia and Afghanistan. And it didn't succeed there. And then the, the Soviets just shut down the relations with those countries and there was nearly no interaction between um, the countries. They always considered the British as their arch enemy and also in files, every time something goes wrong, the British are responsible for that. So that was their main issue. It was always the British when something went wrong, even though it was the incompetence within the, the, the Soviet state apparatus. Um, the British, were constantly paralyzed by an invasion scare. They feared an, an invasion in 1920, 1921, and until 1929, then after the beginning of the world economic crisis, they weren't that fearful anymore. Um, but they never developed any strategy to deal with the region. Um, they always described how the trade develops and sometimes even wrote, well, now British companies could, um, yeah, could come into these markets and gained some profits there, but they never developed anything or gave them credits or had any strategy for the region. And then in the end, they um, yeah, they described how the Soviets would take over the trade in Chinese Turkestan, but they didn't do anything to counter that. And they turned to the form of self-occupation of an imperial apparatus. Here, I've got another map I made for, um, for my PhD dissertation. So they imagined that the British would have a zone in southern Afghanistan and also in southern Chinese Turkestan. Which, in which the Soviets shouldn't yeah, interfere. And on the, on the other side, they accepted that the Soviets had influence in northern Chinese Turkestan, northern Afghanistan, also northern Persian Turkestan, in which the British wouldn't interfere, but they didn't have the means to interfere there. So they didn't have the tradesmen who would go there. They didn't have military officers who would uh, scout those regions. They not even knew where, if there were consulates or not. Um, so that was one form of their self-occupation of an imperial apparatus. They often perceived local actors as if they had no own agency, um, which hindered their understanding of the happenings in the region. And they also did not understand the ideologic and socio-economic dimension of the conflict, and also of the Soviet um, strategy in Central Asia. And my conclusion is that the British were fighting another great game. So concentrated on maps and on rulers and on 
um, yeah, clearly defined zones of influence, well, the Soviets on the other side, they were already fighting um, the first Cold War. So they had their focus on trade relations. They tried to push away the British influence by um, funding their own products and dominate export import markets and then um, turn the countries which succeeded in Xinjiang and didn't succeed in Afghanistan and Persia um, yeah, into their allies. And um, yeah, there I can see similarities with the 1950s and 1960s because there was this socio-economic dimension which the British um, never realized. And that's it. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, David, for uh, for your talk. Um, for everybody, you can write comments and questions into the YouTube comment section. And if the system works, then I, we should then see them here. So if you have questions, please write them directly into the comments of YouTube. And we will. Uh, tr I will try to ask them to David here. So I will remove your... Uh, presentation here for a second since we have a slow delay a, a little delay of a few seconds with youtube we'll just wait and uh, let me just use this opportunity to ask you david um so you looked at all of these uh, thousands tens of thousands of files in order to come up with this diplomatic history that you presented um overall when when you look at the big picture for the, the for the political development of that region of Turkest, of turkestan would you say the influence of these foreign powers is greater or is it at the end still the local developments in these regional governments that mostly influence the way politics took took its course well, that's an interesting question. In, in 1907, you can clearly say, well, the foreign powers, they <laughs> drew their borders and then the, the conflict was over the first great game. But in, in my time, in the 1920s, 1930s, it's more of an interplay. So there are local players who sometimes ally themselves with one of the sides or try to distance themselves. Like the young Bukharans, they are a very fascinating movement. Um, in Bukhara, most people went, or most people who could afford it, went to the Hajj. Um, via Turkey, so they always traveled through Russia and then through Istanbul, and also met there with um, yeah, noblemen and influential politicians in Istanbul, and also knew of the young Turks and of their um, movements, and they allied themselves mostly with the Soviets in the civil war, who um, <laughs> who said to them, "Well, you have to found a communist party, and then <laughs> um, uh, yeah, then this communist party would uh, come to power and in the end it mm -hmm. did. But on the first day, the young Bukharans took over the government in Bukhara city. They f first wrote a message to Kabul. They wanted to establish relations in order to, well, they didn't write it down, but you, you can see in the files, well, they tried to distance themselves from the first day that, from the Soviets. So it, it was always an interplay. It was always in calculations by several actors. And like um, Nadia, Nadia Khan, Nadia Shah, the, the Afghan king who relied on the Pashtuns in British India and also on informal British support, but then gained this, the, the throne, but also yeah, had his own ambitions in order to unite all the Pashtuns and against the British. So it was always a mix and an interplay. And, and I think it's, it's interesting that in 1933, 1934, the, the conflict ended similarly with the Soviets in the north and the British in the south and the Germans mostly cut out of, of most of the regions. Um, but it didn't come there because the British were so strong in order to help the Persian government or the Afghan government to shield off um, Soviet influence. No, in, this, in those cases, it was more local developments in interplay with the Soviets, with the Germans, with the British uh, that shielded off Soviet influence. Um, so it's, it's a more complex picture, and I think we can learn from that today. If you look at local actors, they are not always only pro-Russian, pro-British, or something like that. You have to um, try to analyze their, their, their policy, their ambitions, their goals, and also what is possible. What, what can they achieve and what they can't achieve? And um, yeah, that, that was very fascinating in my, my time. That is quite fascinating. And you know, the um what you what you talked about especially with the soviets fascinated me quite a bit there's a wonderful paper 
um, I forgot the author's name, but he analyzed the um, the foreign policy of first Tsarist Russia towards Mongolia and then the Soviet Russia towards Mongolia. And his conclusion from the, from the files is very clear. The Soviets continued exactly the same policy. Although there was an entirely different uh, clique of people in power, of course, in Moscow, foreign policy and Central Asian policy was not dictated so much by ideology. Although the, the, the Red said, uh, and Lenin said, we will treat you completely differently. They did exactly what you said. They told the Mongols, uh, make make a communist party and then we'll talk again. And in the end, you can see how this was a perfect continuation of Tsarist Russia's uh, uh, foreign policy of, of chipping Mongolia away from uh, from China, right? From the, uh, yeah. well, well uh, first from, from the... Um, Qing Empire, uh, and then, and then, of course, like from the rest of rest of China, and just continue with building these um, diplomatic relations and strengthening the local leaders. Um, would you say that's that's per se the same also in in Central Asia, or is there a difference um, from? Can you see a difference between Tsarist Russia's approach and then? Soviet approach, although I know it's slightly outside the scope of your of your dissertation. Yeah, I haven't analyzed files about the the first great game or um, mm -hmm. Russia and, and Central Asia and First World War because I started in 1919. Um, but there was a theme in the British files. They always said, "Well, it's the same like the Tsarist uh, Russian uh, Empire did." But the interesting thing is that there was the socio-economic dimension. So the Bolsheviks had their plans. They flooded the markets of those regions with um, products that they had um, subsidized so that um, they could conquer those markets by yeah, getting rid of British trade with those regions. And afterwards, they had po political ambitions like taking over Xinjiang in 1934, 19, yeah, 1934. Um, but the British did not understand that. So they, the British thought, well, it's the same like the Tsarist Russians did in, in the whole region. Um, but they didn't understand the socioeconomic dimension of, of, the, of the conflict, but also the cross-border dimension. And I don't know how much the Russian, the Tsarist empire, tried to influence the, the economic um, yeah, orientation of those regions. I know there were some colonial plans for Persia, like making the Caspian Sea um, um, a sea within Russia, and there were plans like this. But I don't know if the Russian Tsarist Empire had the social economic dimension like the Bolsheviks had. So I think it was different. The British thought it was the same, but in the end, the British um, mostly failed with their ambitions in the region. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I have to f look at the, um, the Tsarist files in order to get a comprehensive picture. Um, because I have such a vast region, I couldn't concentrate uh, much on, on the time before that. It's, it's mostly literature that I've reviewed. And then I started in 1919 uh, or 1920 and even some regions because there weren't that much files. But I think it was different than the Tsarist times. Okay, thank you for that. And um, looking at Afghanistan, like um, how, what's your impression? How consolidated was well, let's say, I mean, in Afghanistan in the in the modern borders as we have it, because as you can, I mean, as we can clearly see from your maps, the modern borders were already pretty much set, right? And including that tiny little slither that connects Afghanistan to China, right? That was also yeah. there. And obviously the, the, the British, as you said, kind of respected that, didn't try to cut it off. So uh, was Afghanistan at the time kind of... Like, was it serving this this buffer function for the British and the Soviets? Were they did they both want it there, or from from the way that you see that what they were trying to do, were they trying to integrate it after all into their spheres more? Yeah, first of all, I, I start with the Anglo-Afghan War in in 1919. So with the Afghan attempt to regain independence, and which was automatically mm -hmm. successful, and but until then, Afghanistan, as I have understood it, was pretty much isolated. So the, the Russians, until 1917, tried to make um, cross-border trade with northern Afghanistan, especially until up to the Hindu Kush. Uh, 
mountains uh, as the yeah, natural border in the south. But the British wouldn't let that happen. But they all, the British also didn't make any a trade with northern Afghanistan. So it was quite an isolationist region shielded of foreign influence. There were some Germans there. And then in 1915, 1916, there was this famous German Afghanistan expedition. So there were even German officers in Kabul um, then. And, but still the Afghan king um, relied on the British at that point um, because he knew that his weapons, uh, weapon shipments would come through British India. So he didn't dare to fight off the British influence then. Only he was assassinated in 1919 and then his, I think it was his son. So the next king then um, um, tried to shield off um, or to back off the, the British from Afghanistan. And mostly, Afghanistan had this buffer function. So the, the British were influential, especially in trade questions, close to the British border in Kandahar and in Jalalabad, so close to their territories. They didn't know much what was happening in northern Afghanistan. They knew there were some consulates and the Soviets were um, yeah, also giving development aid, also cross-border trade was flourishing back then. Um, but the Afghan government and the British realized very late was all, always navigating between the British and the Soviets. And if they could also on the French and sometimes the Italians and, and the Germans. So um, from the great power perspective, it was mostly a buffer function, but from practical uh, concern of the Afghans, it was more yeah, like, like the Mongolian third neighbor or third partner strategy. So we try to get influence from other countries in order to yeah, shield ourselves from too much Soviet influence from the north or a British influence from the south. And that mostly worked. The British always feared that the Soviets might annex northern Afghanistan because those territories north of the Hindukush are the territories where the Tajiks, Turkmens and Uzbeks of Afghanistan live. So the power base of the northern alliance then uh, at the end of the 20th and early uh, 21st century. Um, so there were those ethnic kinship with the Soviet territories and the British always thought, well, maybe they could annex it. And they always considered this would be the first step in a war. Um, but then in 1929, after the, the recession began, they even had plans where even if they would annex it, the Hindu Kush would make a great natural barrier. And then we still would have rump Afghanistan south of the Hindu Kush mountains or south of Kabul, and that would be a great buffer. So for the British, it always had this buffer function. Well, the Soviets, they tried um, their national revolutionary movement or government of, of King Amanullah. They tried to support him. But when that failed and King Nadir Shah um, yeah, was the new king and turned to another modernization policy, yeah, they just ceased exports. And they were. I think they were glad that the borders were secure and there would be no cross-border um, Basmachi um, attacks like in Garm in 1929 when Tajikistan was split in two um, but they didn't have any strategy in order to um, yeah, get rid of this king and then uh, maybe gain influence again no they were just um, shut out and then after 1941 they regained a bit of strength because the, the allied tried to shield off German influence the allies combined so the Soviets and the British together I tried to shield of German influence from Afghanistan and then they regained strength. But it mostly had this, this buffer function and the central government often controlled large areas of the country in northern Afghanistan after King Shah and Nadia Shah um, yeah, ascended the throne. Then he didn't have much influence in the north because he was a Pashtun and also had this Pashtun power base and he had to reconquer more or less the territories there. Um, but besides that, those years mostly um, had control of, of, yeah, of the country and yeah, was used as a buffer from, from both sides. Very interesting. And, um, you know, like the, regions that, the region that you're talking about is like geographically quite vast. And as you, as you pointed out, is like ethnically very diverse. So although you're talking about Turkestan, like not everybody inside there is Turkic, right? I mean, the Pashtus are, are a completely different, different story. Um, but was there also in that, during that time period, some form of like trans-Turkic, Turk, 
Turkestan kind of movement because for the Mongols that existed, there was always trans-Mongol kind of uh, uh, idea. Let's build like outer Mongolia and inner Mongolia and somehow connect it. And that was that was then abandoned for practical reasons. But there was always this idea that we've got people on the other side of that of that soft border over there. And for the Turkic Turkestan, can you can you report a similar kind of movement as well inside the population or was that not a thing no that was wasn't really a thing there was many trans border influences like for example the the central asians um until 19 the mid 1920s they used the arab script so they had their turkic um written language oh the, the their turkic language with the arab script and they exchanged many ideas with the persians Oh, no, no, not with the Persians, with, with Turkey. So Turkey was always this fixture of we can go to Istanbul, get influences there, get reformist ideas from there. And when the young Bukharans um, took over the country um, and the, the monarchy was abolished in, in Bukhara, um, the, the old monarchs, they used Persian as a, as a language. And they were the Persian upper class and the Turkics were the, the lower class. And then the young Bukharans took over and they... Turkicized their country and also through Soviet influence then they got the Latin script later they changed it again so there were many changes in, in the script question um, but um, f in the beginning Turkey itself was a, a fixture of influence and of ideas and of uh, exchange and also going through Turkey to Mecca uh, in order to go to the Hajj but even though there was no pan turkey or pan turinist movement there were always those cross-border influences, like the terminus Uyghur was developed on a, on a Congress in Tashkent, so the, on, you know, on a Soviet-dominated Congress, because they, they had no name for, for the people, the, the Turkic people that was living in yeah, Xinjiang or Uyghuristan, as, might, as you might say today. Um, but um, yeah, so there were always those influences, and King Amanola was highly influenced by and Tazi, who was, I think, a Tajik, and um, he had also this cross-border influences. And uh, there were many connections, and also, yeah, especially reformers, there were also young Kashgarians who then tried to model their reforms on, on the young Bukharans and on the young Turks, and also a young Afghan party. So they were all considered themselves young. So there was this idea of a greater cultural region and that could influence each other, but there were no aspirations in order to um, yeah, combine the territories. What the Soviets then did was um, the na national delineation of the borders. So Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan were, were, were created in the mid-1920s. Um, and in the British files, you can also find um, some files where they say, well, maybe they make combined Turkish um, yeah, state of the, of the Soviet Union. So they could influence the Turkey countries across the border. But that Turkic state would have been by area the, the second largest and by population, I think, the third largest um, republic within the Soviet Union. So that might have also meant that the political influence um, uh, but, uh, yeah, could be taken back from Moscow in order to for this yeah, regional capital Tashkent, which would have governed from, from, from the Caspian Sea to close to Mongolia, maybe. Um, and that wasn't created like this. So um, there were some ideas, but it wasn't a large influential movement, either on the intellectual side or even in the population. Mostly they considered themselves locals and they, they, um, yeah, the, what they called themselves was, was the region they lived in mostly. And so there wasn't a, a common pan-Turanian understanding. Those ideas, I think, flourished then in the 1940s, 1950s even. Uh, especially in Turkey. And Turkey was still very interesting because some of the young Bukharan government members who then went over to the Basmachi rebels later ended up in Turkey. Um, and they still had their, yeah, their not government in exile, but their, their cultural associations. And um, they, uh, Turkey was always a, a fixture for them, um, but not the Turkestan as a whole, as a region ranging from Turkey to Mongolia. Or even even to Japan, because I think the picture that you showed is is absolutely correct. Like I I, I forgot to send this 
the information about this talk to a friend of mine, Noriko, who's also uh, studying the region. And <clears throat> Japan, in fact, also tried to become a player but uh, I think they never systematically managed. They, I mean, uh, but the, ever ever since the nineteen, the late nineteen twenties, they somehow tried also to gain a foothold. But they didn't even have the linguistic capacities, although they studied the region. Um, <clears throat> but uh, um, so I had this. So one point about that. So there was a Japanese embassy in Turkey. I think pretty early in the mid nineteen twenties. But I think there wasn't anyone, any Turkish embassy in or diplomatic mission in Tehran or in Kabul. But in the British files in the early 1930s, I can um, they describe how more and more Japanese products arrived there. And also in, in Xinjiang, there were also Japanese products. The Japanese were very present in during the Russian Civil War. So when the Russians had to, yeah. Yeah, get out of Xinjiang in order to fight the civil war. Then there were even Japanese officers in Urumqi and trying to get some yeah, economic foothold in the region. But the isolationist government yeah, um, sent them back. And then the Japanese don't, don't play a role for the whole 1920s. And then after the world economic crisis started, then through trade, the Japanese reappear. And I think in 1933 or 1934, they even establish an embassy in Kabul or a diplomatic mission in Kabul. And then they are present there. But that starts very late in, in the period that I analyzed or researched. It's, like, it's funny. Like, Japan is coming later. It <clears throat> comes later even after the Germans. It's like, yeah. yeah. The, the Germans were already late to the game and, and Japan even later. But the... Yeah. the um, I had this one uh, discussion recently about uh, the imperial, uh, the imperial, the, the colonial period of of Europe, basically accidentally or intentionally, um, always working through uh, divide and conquer, divide and conquer, keep peoples apart. And and a colleague was making the argument: this can happen unintentionally. This is just like how things go. Um, do you see any such pattern as well for that region? I mean, it was already very, very split up, right? And very splintered. But did you see any kind of like um, uh, great powers trying to uh, uh, keep locals from banding together in order to have to have more local influence accidentally or not? Well, the, the Germans had no political aspirations, so... Um... I can take them out of the equation. The Soviets had those cross-border um, approaches, and they also tried to, to influence the Turkmens in, in Persia and in Afghanistan. So there, the, the thing was quite the opposite. There were even influential Mongols in Xinjiang, and they tried to in influence them. So there was, because of the colonial borders that were drawn before the Soviets arrived, um, they tried quite the opposite. The British, I think they weren't strong enough. Uh, so, so they weren't economically, politically or military powerful enough in order to, to have some designs or even local approaches. Um, they had their consulate, for example, in, in southern in Xinjiang and in, in southern Chinese Turkestan. Um, but um, they didn't try to shield it off. They had their good relations with the local mayor or with the local administrator of the region. Um, and they always relied on, on those personal connections uh, and knew that the Soviets couldn't gain much strength if, if they have good relations with the mayor there, but they didn't try to implement any colonial or half-colonial or post-colonial design on, on that region. Um, and in Afghanistan, they, they imagined their zone of influence in southern Afghanistan because that's the region where the British consulate were and where the most of the British Indian trade was with, but um, they didn't have any any special design. It was very fascinating for me that the British didn't have any strategy at all. So they always described what was happening in weekly reports, sometimes four pages every week about trade issues, political issues, military issues, but they didn't do anything about it. And what was very fascinating for me was um, after 1917, the Russian trade with Xinjiang collapsed, and then the British wrote down, well, that's a great opportunity. Now British firms can 
can dominate the market and we just have to export here some things. And then the following years, they describe, well, now we have Japanese products here. Now we have American products here. Oh, the Germans are coming back. And oh, now the Soviets are coming back. And in the end, in, I think in 1930, the, the Soviets dominate 90% of imports and exports of the region. So the rich were there. They were describing it, but they didn't do anything. They had no strategy. They had no idea what was going on. And they, yeah, they just thought, well, laissez-faire, maybe British companies might come here into the market and dominate it then, but it didn't happen. Um, that, that was very interesting, the, the non-strategy of the British or the, the non-conception or conceptual designs for, for the region. Do you think it has something to do with the British Empire already kind of crumbling after the First World War? I mean, India, I mean, India wasn't going well, right? I mean, the in terms of control the, the, compared to 40 years earlier. I mean, the, 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 the entire situation had changed. Uh, or any other, any other hypothesis? Well, um, through the files that I've looked through, the diplomatic files, the sometimes even military files, you, they couldn't imagine that the empire was falling apart, or crumbling. I have some files from the early 1920s when um, the British described themselves as the champions of civilizations and the, the Soviets are trying to tear them down, but the, the civilization will win. Then in 1931, New Delhi was opened. So the new plant capital for India, which was meant to be the capital of British India for the next thousand years or something like that. Um, so even at, at the end of the period that I um, researched, um, the British did not consider themselves to be on a on a weak basis or in decline or something like that. Um, they, um, I think, well, I, d I don't know why they didn't make strategies. I also talked with some professors who know more about East Asia and they also told me, well, they, did, they didn't make much strategies. They opened the markets and then they hoped that uh, yeah, British companies would come in and then dominate the markets and they could dominate the world. But in the 19th, 20s and especially in the 1930s, there weren't any British new products or companies coming into these markets in order to, to, to dominate them. And yeah, the British, I think they, they turned to strategies after the Second World War, but I think it was too late for the British Empire for them. And um, but I, did, I don't know why I didn't do that. It was very, uh, yeah, I think it was very influenced by old um, imaginations of British noblemen, how they should behave. I also had one consul in Kashka who used his influence, uh, who used the, the money of the consulate for prostitutes and for um, speculating on currency in order to gain some money. And he was um, yeah, taken out of the diplomatic service, never had a diplomatic role again. And his successor, didn't write it into the official files, what he found out there. He wrote private letters to his wife describing what his predecessor had made there and how this had um, yeah, not helped the British because there were Swedish Catholic missionaries. I think they were Catholic. No, uh, Swedish Protestant missionaries there. And they turned away from the British because of the behavior of those old consul. And they turned to, to the Germans again. Um, but they couldn't write it down in the files because there was this imagination of yeah, you don't um, write bad about your predecessor or something like that. It's, they were just out of touch of reality of what was happening, going on, what was going on on the ground there. So they had their man on the spot, um, but they had those old established rules and they couldn't find a way to, to deal with yeah, what was happening here, to analyze what was happening there and to realize the cross-border economic strategy of the Soviets and what should be done. And yeah, they were just sitting there in 1947, British India, um, yeah, dissolved and India and Pakistan uh, were established and then the, the consulates were closed and that's it. So is, it, I, yeah. is yeah. it maybe like, okay, maybe this is a bit polemic, but <laughs> is, there, is there a certain kind of like disinterest in the region from the only other one that could have like... Uh, influenced it heavily because from your what you're saying is like okay China uh, the, the the Xinjiang government quite isolationist so kind of already closing it off and you know the uh, 
the, the the Republic of China and so on, they had completely different problems in on, on their side and they had to worry with that. The Japanese too far away and too 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 difficult to get there. The uh, the Germans tried, but you know you can you can do only so much and uh, a little bit of like uh, exchange with like schools and so on and send some expeditions. Okay, fine. Persia was in was having its own problems to deal with at at the time. Turkey as well, right? Only kind of. The, the sick man at the Bosporus, right, at the, uh, at the time. And so the only one that was really heavily, honestly interested in incorporating this region into its uh, empire were the Soviets, obviously. And they did, right? They did carve it out and then they did kind of uh, try to, to, to play this imperial, imperial game as far as they could and, and kept that ready steady. And the, the British seem just also kind of disinterested so is there kind of a could you call it a form of like uh, um, being um, uh, tired of empire or tired of tired of tired of the game or is uh, that some kind of negligence or something like that negligence um well, I'm not sure British India was was very important for them so when the Basmachi um, dominated like eastern Tajikistan, the British knew where we have this buffer zone, Afghanistan, then we have Chinese Turkestan, and now we even have the rebels there within the Russian or the, the borders of the former Russian Empire. So we have three buffers um, to shield off um, the, the Soviet influence there. But even as those buffer zones vanished, first the Basmashi were crushed, then the Soviets gained influence. In Afghanistan and in Chinese Turkestan, um, they didn't do anything about it, and they were dealing with communists in India. And India was a fixture for the Comintern, so for the revolutionary aspirations of the Soviets. Um, but they, the communists in India, I think, did not gain strength, so that the British feared that a cross-border action by the Soviets could, yeah turn India into yeah, an independent country or even a Soviet Republic or something like that. So I think their security apparatus, their domestic security apparatus in British India was strong enough. Um, so they didn't have to deal with those outside matters. The, the interesting part is um, in, in London, I had to go to the National Archives in order to get the foreign office files because they were dealing with uh, foreign affairs, but I also had to go to the British Library because there were the files of, the, or there are the files of the British Indian government, which was its own government by British in India. And they had their own foreign and political department, which was kind of their foreign office. And they were responsible for the foreign affairs dealing with Southern Persia, Afghanistan, and Xinjiang. And um, they, yeah, they, observe the, the developments there but even in the end um it's the the red army and the and the, the local warlord Cheng Shikai that the soviets uh, supported in 1934 in Xinjiang they arrived in Kashka so they were close to the british indian border but even then nothing revolutionary happened in india so they always had this fear that there might be this invasion or this influence by revolutionaries coming through those borders but even when the Soviets were close to the border, um, nothing was happening in India. And I think they knew that their, or they thought that their colonial security apparatus in British India was strong enough to, to yeah, to shield off the the Bolshevik influences or the Soviet influence there. Um, and the fascinating thing is that they always thought of the first great game. So you thought, are they tired of the game? <laughs> they knew that there was this game for the whole time. And they even fought in similar categories. Um, but um, I don't know if they were ever tired. In 1929, when there was this cut in economic relations and they, they somehow became more realistic, um, yeah, maybe the Soviets might gain northern Afghanistan, but we still have the Hindukush as a, as a buffer zone. And, um, but I think, I think this invasion scare that um, led to this... Uh, self occupation of self occupation of this imperial apparatus, and they couldn't find any way to get out of this uh, 
yeah, labyrinth. It was kind of a labyrinth. They, they were mostly dealing with themselves and not dealing with the outside world. And apparently, especially during the Second World War, they were losing ground in, in India. And then um, mm. India became independent. Um, but um, the, the outside affairs, yeah, it was... It was fascinating to read all those detailed reports and then no strategy, no subsequent strategy reacting what was happening on the ground. Um, yeah, it's, it was just fascinating. Quite really interesting. And maybe maybe a last or second last question. Um, why is it that you are that this is the first dissertation on this topic? A Mongolian friend of mine asked me that actually. It's like, what? Their historians are working on this only now? Uh, based on what they're not working on, they shouldn't get a salary, was his comment. <laughs> uh, why is it that it took a hundred years, basically, to for an analysis of the of the, uh, the 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 diplomatic history of Turkestan? I mean, from the outside, right? Not you're not looking at the local ones, but from the the the, yeah. the, the powers. The problem is, especially in Germany, Central Asia is often part of Eastern European history. It's because it belonged to the Russian Empire and then Soviet Union. Mostly Central Asian affairs are kind of Eastern European affairs. I was an Eastern European historian before I started. I wrote a book about Slovakia and then I turned East and furthermore East. And those colonial drawn borders still influence also the writing of dissertations and the understanding of the regions like Pakistan and India, they are South Asia, so that's totally a different region. China is East Asia, and Persia, it's more like Orientalist studies, as we, as we still call it in, in Germany. <laughs> so that's more close to the Arab countries and, and Turkey and those regions. And my area, so Turkestan is a cross-border area. That's something, yes, rarely people have considered as a as a as a whole region there are some dissertation or some works about afghanistan and central russian central asia or soviet central asia then there are other um works about chinese central asia and also others about persia and um, but there wasn't any attempt of a trans regional or transnational approach to the region and if you read the dissertations or the the works about afghanistan then you know oh now the basmachi come from the north now they um, the Basmachi regained strength of, after Kalakani became king and now they can go back to Tajikistan. You find it in, in the works of Tajikistan about Tajikistan and the works about Afghanistan, but there was no, no trans-regional approach. I think, I think in the last 20 years there was more this approach where we shouldn't look only at borders. We could look at border areas and how they influence each other, but we should have taken a more transnational, trans-regional approach. And yeah, I was the first one to, to do that in, in that way and also have this interesting starting point in 1919 when Afghanistan became independent and Bukhara and Khiva were for a short time also independent and then this end point with 1933-1934 with this repetition of the Anglo-Russian convention but not through negotiations through central governments of great powers but all in this interplay of local developments uh, and international developments. Um, but yeah, I think that's... that's it's just so interesting, you know, because you, you research this area where usually our mental map goes white mm. because there's Europe, then there's Eastern Europe, then there's Turkey, then, and then there's China. <laughs> it's like, it's this white area where it doesn't make sense to me because we have like one huge continent that goes from Lisbon to Vladivostok, but somehow we think of this one landmass as two, as Asia and Europe. And this area seems just, it's like this forget this forgotten, this forgotten plot of land, almost, in, in also a lot of history, but also our, our common perception, right, of, of what's happening there. Uh, a lot of lot of perception is like, oh, if you want to go from Europe to China, you've got to do what Magellan does, you've got to take a boat. And, and go over there. No, you don't. You can walk there. Um, <clears throat> I, I this is a serious question that I have. Is like, why is it that although the empire and so on, and you know the imperial, uh, all of those intrigues, they happened in that area and they were quite intense e way into the twentieth century, way to the Second World War, right? But still, the black the map kind of goes blank mentally there, and, and we don't have a transnational history of the area. <laughs> 
yeah, no, not yet. Um, maybe my dissertation could be a starting point for other works, mm -hmm. also from fr not from bottom down, uh, top down, but also from bottom up, maybe as as a next work. Um, but yeah, interestingly, it's it's mostly forgotten. And I've also analyzed for my master's thesis. I looked only at the German files here in Berlin. Um, and I looked at the files in the First World War, and the, the Germans had some ambitious plans in Russian Central Asia in 1917, 1918, and they didn't think of the distances. They knew the cities. They know there's Tashkent, this huge city, and Samarkand, this old city, and then there's uh, somewhere, a sub-city in, in, in Tajikistan, maybe, which wasn't called Tajikistan then, but they didn't, they had plans to send consuls there in order to influence the region, but they, they imagined it like islands. So there were, this, the city, it's known, we know it from Karl May writings or something like that, or from old stories, um, but we, we don't know the, the vast distances that our consuls have to take in order to get there. And the German bridge to uh, Central Asia in 1917, 1918 was the Caspian Sea. They, they thought, well, when we are in Baku, then we can take the ship Islands. <laughs> then we can take the ship to Krasnovodsk, what is now called uh. Tokmenbashi, I think. And then we can take the train there to, to the large cities and go there. But they didn't think of where we could take the, the land route through Orenburg and then go there. So it, it was kind of like an overseas empire, but there is no sea, oh, the Caspian Sea, but there is, it's, it's a large uh -huh. land area. And yeah, it's, it's, it's mostly, mostly forgotten or Afghanistan was a fixture in the last 20 years, mm -hmm. especially in Germany. Uh, and interestingly, when the NATO withdrew, then I think a, a Taliban minister said, well, the Germans were here in the 1920s and we like them and we would like them to come back. And most people might have thought, well, we were there in the 1920s. What, what happened there? But uh, already in the 1920s, they were there even before the Japanese came or in, 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 Afghan, in the Afghan case. But yeah, it's, it's mostly forgotten. It's kind of this off story even if you look at press reports today it's always this where there's china there's russia and then there's central asia in the middle but if you look at trade statistics you can mm -hmm. see kazakhstan has italy as its main export partner and tajikistan has turkey and um i think well turkmenistan now has china but they, they are dealing in their trade issues they are more dealing with the european countries than with many asian countries but they are still considered here in germany well it's 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 far off I think Japanese is closer to to many in the in, in the mind or in the conception of the Eurasian continent than those Central Asian states, and yeah, it's 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 a pity. I don't know why. <laughs> I think we should do more with that region. It is a pity. Yes, it's what it's what links the continent. It's like it's it's what what, what keeps it together. It's a glue. Um, so, uh, Laili, if you're listening, uh, transnational history of uh, of Central Asia. I know that uh, there's a PhD student uh, listening, at least one. Uh, transnational history of Central Asia, transnational history of Turkestan, The way that you laid it out, like there's there's a lot of history to it. There's a lot of current affairs going on. So I would like to thank you very much, David, for giving us a very uh, interesting presentation and also laying out some of the groundwork that can 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 be used. To, for further research, as we as we as we like to do. So, um, I will uh, close the stream with this. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope to see you very soon again. Bye. Goodbye, everybody. Bye bye.